On today's LA Currents, we sit down with Streets LA to discuss the inventive ways they are leading progress on environmental issues. Then we go behind the scenes with the beloved Pershing Square concert series as they adapt the music for stay at home. And finally, we speak with two of the leading trainers from LAPD's Active Shooter Program about run, hide, fight awareness. Adele Haj Khalil was appointed in 2018 to lead the Bureau of Street Services, better known as Streets LA. I sat down with him to talk about their creative approach for the betterment of Los Angeles. In addition to resurfacing streets, they reconstruct and clean them. They maintain our urban forest, which includes over 680,000 street trees and 295 acres of landscaped median islands. Streets LA. I'm delighted to be joined today by Adele Haj Khalil, the Executive Director of the Department of Public Works Bureau of Street Services. So Great. nice to have you here. Good having you. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on being one of the coolest in LA. I mean, literally, that's the designation. You know, I never thought I'll be the coolest in LA. Uh, you know, and my kids now think of me differently. Uh, I'm, I'm a cool dad now. You are. Which, which is a good thing, but uh, it's about the work that people do, mm -hmm. and we're proud of that work. So it's an award. Uh, through an organization, Climate Resolve, and it's at its 10-year anniversary. So what, how does Los Angeles work with Climate Resolve, and what is it? Sure. You know, I want to start off by saying it's, it's you know, uh, climate action and, and fighting the, the climate change, and adapting to climate change is our top priority for us today and tomorrow. The mayor has really uh, stood up as a, a leader when it comes to climate change uh, as part of his Green New Deal and the sustainability plan and now part of the C40 across the, the globe. You know, in L.A., temperature going to triple uh, in terms of uh, days with uh, 93 degrees and higher will triple over the next 20 years. Right. So what we need to know is figure out how we can deal with this, this new normal. And, and to make it safe for everyone. Our goal in Streets LA is to enhance the quality of life for all. That's the new mission in Streets LA. It's not just about fixing streets, it's how we make our life better. So Climate Resolve is a nonprofit organization, environmental organization, focused on taking the global issue of climate and bringing it down to the local level. And working with local community leaders, with local community members, and translating that message of climate action and global uh, uh, climate change into what can you do in a city like Los Angeles. And that's the partnership we've had with them. Uh, they worked first on the uh, green roofs, but now we partnered with them on cool streets. I, that's what I wanted to ask And urban you. cooling, yeah. So there's obviously, as you mentioned, an enormous amount of cli climate concerns here in Los Angeles, but then there's this thing, cool streets. What is a cool street? Black asphalt tend to absorb heat. So during the day, all that heat that's coming down is being absorbed by the asphalt. And it basically emits it back during the evening. It makes it hot. The, the home is, is getting hotter. So we want to reduce the temperature. So the idea that we had in 2014 and really built on it in 2017 with Climate Resolve and others is how can we maybe bring something else to reflect that heat so the idea of, you know, cool pavement or putting a light color coating on the black asphalt, like a white paint in a way, uh, used from emulsion, that can really reflect the heat off. And, and, and we are the first city, I think in the whole U.S., that applied it on public streets. And we started doing it in one block, then we moved to multiple blocks, and uh, now we're doing it as a urban cooling project. So we were measuring temperature, and it was like 20 degree difference between the asphalt and the cool pavement. So we think it can be a temperature about 12 degrees after it wears down, but it's a big difference. Uh, 12 degrees is, is significant when it comes to being able to walk, and people testify to that. When people come in and say, hey, we walked this, it's, it's pretty nice. So to me now, everybody wants cool pavement because it's, it, it makes the environment better. And, and we're proud, it's, it's, science shows it. And we're gonna continue doing more testing and more analysis and figure out how we can do better. You know, in Streets LA, one of the three anchors I use all the time is innovation, integration, and inclusion. 
And those are anchors that we are building everything on. And innovation is critical. We need to start thinking differently of how we deal and provide services, and this is one of them. You made a pretty dramatic pivot <laughs> when everything went to the safer at home, sure. and it sort of benefited business districts. So what was the decision? How did you decide what to do and yeah. what, did you been, what have you been doing? With the safer at home orders, people were staying at home and we relaxed the parking enforcement so people were parking and not going to work. So we could not pave our streets uh, and, and we haven't stopped the day you know, throughout the COVID, every day we continue to work. All our workers have been really putting themselves out there to fix our sidewalks, repair our streets. But we didn't want to interfere with people's lives uh, being at home. So we knew that in, in the uh, commercial areas, many of the streets were empty. So we came up with this and said, let's kind of we just switch schedules. Let's move all commercial work done in this period of time and let's move on it and get that done. We quickly pivoted and starting April 10th, we started paving around commercial areas. And uh, the first street was 7th Street downtown and it took two days. That would have <laughs> what taken- What would that normally take? Four to five and with all the headaches and calls and complaints and, and traffic impact, this was like empty and it was amazing. But we did 5th, 6th, 7th here. Olive, we're finishing, I think yesterday we finished Alameda. People complain all the time about Alameda. And these streets would have taken a lot longer to do with a lot of impact on businesses and commuters every day. We're able to get them done. And we're continuing to do that work till about September. And hopefully everything can get back to normal and we can start going back to the neighborhoods to fix their streets. By the way, now the program and the plans of street to be paved is on our websites, streetsla at lacity.org. You can find out your street and know when it's scheduled to be paved. You can look at the previous streets and the condition. You can know how bad your street is and what's coming next. So we have three years of work oh, wow. on the website and we're hoping to have a five-year plan to make sure that the public knows what we're doing and how we're doing it. But if somebody has a question, please call us. We're here to serve you. I also understand that you realize that you save the city money when you're fixing pavement. How does that work? Every sidewalk that we have a claim, the average claim is about $160,000. From someone getting From injured someone because they fall? Getting injured, okay. so that's a liability. For every street that's damaged and where there's an accident or some injury, it's about average $250,000. Wow. And, and what we wanted to do is, instead of investing in paying out claims, but also saving people from being injured. Let's invest in making the streets better. So this is the first year, last year, was the first year we start focusing on failed streets, fixing sidewalks, and doing all this with a strategic and surgical look. Last year I project that we saved about $335 million in liability reduction by these works that we did. So I'm happy with the work. And every penny we invest in the infrastructure, we're saving by making the streets safe. You said if staff goes home and their kids ask what they do at work, I tell them not to say they fix sidewalks and streets or plant and trim trees. What they do is save lives. Our job is saving lives. What yeah. prompted that thought and how do you express that to your staff? So I tell my staff, and we need to have a higher calling. For us, really, all of us want to feel that we have a contribution. That's why we changed our mission to enhancing the quality of life for all. It's not about just fixing. It's making people's life better, hiring people, providing shade, fixing streets. It's making people's lives better. I want my staff to embody that need to really feel that they are making a difference in people's lives. And, and that's something during COVID was more important than ever, that my staff were working really hard every day while people are staying at home needed that higher calling. I called it hope. Right. And I said, you guys, by you showing people that we're still working for the city, you're providing hope for the future. It's not the end of the day. Well, congratulations. It's been really fabulous talking with you, and I wish you all the world of luck. Maria, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, it's fair to say nothing is normal these days. But for one downtown concert series, they've taken the opportunity to find a clever way to get the music to Angelinos. The 
Pershing Square Downtown Stage is a six week concert series that we've done for 15 years. When um, the pandemic hit, of course, we weren't able to do that concert series. We had our entire concert series already booked, so we were ready to go full streams ahead with a, a really good lineup. We really only had a couple of weeks to switch gears and pivot to how we could like make our vision still come to life. And I said, okay, I've got a concept. What if we take the concert series virtual, we record some concerts live, and then we edit them and stream them on several platforms of the internet. The Pershing Square Summer Concert Series is looking a little different this year. We're taking the concert experience you love and bringing it to the comfort of your home. Over the duration of the summer, we'll be posting sessions of great Los Angeles bands for you to enjoy online. You can check out these shows on your phone, tablet, or computer. And they'll be posted to your favorite social media platform like Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Basically, we had to start from scratch, pivot over to a streaming online service. When I wrote the proposal and I brought it forth to management, they said, this is a great proposal. Let's do it. But we have no budget. We had to get all new bands that were willing to uh, donate their services and um, perform for free. We have no budget for production or sound or lighting. We had to find sponsors for everything. So I called on two people who I thought would be there to help us. Come on in, guys. Louise was one of the people who was first to, to come back and take a gamble with music and, and seeing how we could do this in a safe way. We get, gave them our equipment so they could use it for the concerts. The money that goes in everything to pull these kind of concerts off is obviously one of the, one of the biggest obstacles that we have at this time. But uh, we got to be in a good place in the world where everyone's trying to come together to make this happen. Make it happen together. Artists want to perform, they want to work, they want to, they want to sing, they want to connect with their audience. And because of the situation now, I think everybody feels that this is a good way to do it. The biggest challenge was basically taking the knowledge that we had accumulated out there in the field and bringing it to like a studio setting. A lot of us are, are being pushed, we've been pushing ourselves to learn a little bit more of, 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 of different things. So that has, has uh, added a lot of value, especially to our team. Because of the change, we lost like a lot of the equipment we usually use. So we're working with a lot of stuff from home, like we're using our own computers, our own cameras. Um, I think the audio guy brought it, like his own mixing board. So we're just uh, basically uh, kind of like bootstrapping it, using what we have. And these borrowings don't want to be in. Got me crawling from my skin. Uh, uh, check it. One, two, one, two. Hey, hey. comes in and it's pretty similar to an actual concert. Um, as you can see, the setup is pretty much almost the same. After the band comes in and records their entire set, which usually like is like a 45 minutes to an hour, everything's recorded into the mixing board, which is mixed back there, just like at a concert. And we also have um, a variety of cameras here. We have like six different angles that are also being recorded independently, and those are gonna be edited together later. So after we get uh, a finalized edited video of the performance, we have to upload everything to the platforms that we were gonna be showing it on. So that would have been YouTube and Facebook. We just went up with uh, Mirage, with the Fleetwood Mac tribute and everything went off without a hitch. Welcome everybody, we're called Mirage and we're so happy to be with you here. 
for this very special broadcast from the city of Los Angeles, Pershing Square. We're going to bring you the very best of Philippe and Mac. I know I got nothing to say. Someone has taken my place. When times go bad, when times go We just finished doing the first one and, and oh my god, I'm, I'm blown away. It went off really well. We got a lot of good feedback. From what I've been here, and it's everybody's very excited, very waiting for the rest of the bands to come out. We're hoping that we can, you know, just keep on doing this throughout the entire summer. People are at home and they, they still want to be entertained. They still want to have access to the arts. Now we're seeing how important they are to bring people back up, bring the energy back up, bring people together. Music is a great thing and it makes people happy. Things are kind of boiling up a little bit because people want to be out there, people want to perform, people want to be playing. It's, it's, it's what people does, you know, especially for musicians. We wish we could be there with you in person. But this is the next best thing, I think, uh, under the circumstances. And I really believe, I honestly do believe in my heart, that this, is, this too shall pass, and we will be together again, and we'll be enjoying all this great music live. But right now, we'd like to thank the city of Los Angeles once again for making this available so people can stay safe, stay home, and still enjoy these great old songs. Wake up. Live streaming has been a, a thing even before COVID. So people were were able to say if they wanted to see the Coachella Music Festival, they could do that. Now I think it's going to happen even more so because people are still weary on going to big concerts uh, with a lot of people. However, I do feel that the concert industry is going to come back stronger than ever because people are aching to get out, to go interact with their friends and be social. People are gonna flock to venues to, to see their favorite bands and, and all the shows that they wanna see. We've been on the cutting edge of this for the last three months trying to figure out how exactly we could be a part of changing and be on a pivot point for the world. Uh, streaming is definitely going to be a part of what happens from now on. We still obviously pray for live events to get back together and humans together in one place. That energy that of everybody being next to each other and feeling that rock and roll show, that's never going to change. You want to be there, you want to feel that energy in that room and that, like at the concert series at the park, you, you are there, you see the whole city, you see the, the park, the plants, you, talk to people, you, you can talk to the bands, you know, you can talk to us and we're very friendly. So we all miss that. So I feel like eventually when we come back to it, it's gonna be a great energy out there. Everybody's gotta not forget what music is and music's something that brings the world together. And right now, I think that's what we need the most. So thank you to Louise and the city of LA for keeping music happening. And we will all be on the same page, hoping to keep this going all together at Pershing Square again one day. Run, hide, fight. It's words you don't normally want to talk about, which is why it's crucial that we do. Mona Curry and Commander Alan Hamilton join me to discuss what you should do in an active shooter incident.
preparing for the unthinkable, an active shooter. You can actually prepare. I'm joined today by Mona Curry, who's an emergency manager, to tell us all about the program, Run, Hide, Fight. Let's go ahead and go through the program itself because it's, it, it's amazing that there's actually something you can tangibly and practically do in a scenario that seems impossible to manage. So there's the run. How do you, what are you supposed to do? That's the first thing you're supposed to do and how does, what spurs you on to run? Well, so the program has three uh, options. So, and what we do is we, t we try to help people understand what their options are to survive. So run being the best option um, and, and the first option and the one you should always do if you can do, and then there's hide and then there's fight. So the minute you hear something, you, you, you start to think something's going on. If you can run safely away from that threat, that's what you should definitely do. Being an emergency manager, uh, I've always taught people to know their environment, uh, know what's above you in case of an earthquake, know your exits in case of a fire. It's the same thing with the run, hide, fight always understand where you are. So if you're in an unfamiliar area, look for those exits. Just, you know, have an idea of the space you're in and what you can do to protect yourself. Every situation is different because you could be in your office, you could be at your place of worship, you could be at a school, you could be at a mall, you could be at a movie theater. So you have to kind of judge your surroundings and then figure out what the best option is going to be for you at that moment. There might be a situation where you can't run. Well, then you can hide. So when you hide, you have to do things to really make yourself um, unknown to the shooter. So you would turn off the lights. If you're in a room, you would lock the door. Um, you would find a safe area, a secure space. F and also when you're hiding, you should also try to to grab something, you know, it could be this cup, it could be anything, there are plenty of things on this set that you could use to defend yourself if it came to that. You should also be thoughtful about where you hide, heavy, solid. Yes, yes. Now, we teach that in our training, the difference of, say, hiding behind a curtain, which kind of you know, stop someone from seeing you, but it doesn't really protect you if someone's shooting at you. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference between hiding behind some solid um, piece of furniture or, you know, behind a solid wall that might protect you a little bit more. So you definitely have to be conscious and aware of the difference between the two things. Mm -hmm. And then the last part, fight. And that's obviously something that you hope no one has to get to that point, but so fight is the last option. It's the least desirable option. But if you have no other options, you're going to fight. So you have to commit yourself to that act because if you're making that choice, you're at a very serious point in the whole incident. It's life or death at this point. So you've got to commit yourself to that act and be, you know, 100% behind it, I am going to fight, I am going to survive. So at that point, you would have hopefully, you know, looked at your surroundings and found something to use as a weapon. Sometimes you can, if there's more than one, one person could be a distraction and then the second person would be the uh, attacker. What about people who, uh, you know, or have some sort of disability or something like that. A couple years ago, we developed a great video. Um, it, it's called Use Your Abilities to Survive an Active Shooter. We teach people, uh, don't ever just give up. Use your abilities, whatever abilities you have. And also, if someone has a mobility disability, so that they're maybe in a, um, a wheelchair assisted living device, take the uh, the part out where your foot goes mm -hmm. and use that as a weapon. Oh, I mean, everybody should have a chance. Mm -hmm. Don't just give up. And I encourage everyone to, to view that video. Thank you for all of this information. Um, scary as it is, but important as well. Thank you. If you can't run and you can't hide, your final option is to fight. In this case, you and the people who are with you need to commit to act as aggressively as possible. Arm yourself with anything that can be used as a weapon. 
Individuals with disabilities or access and functional needs should remember that wheelchairs and other medical equipment can be used as a weapon or as a distraction. Other weapons could be fire extinguishers, canes, crutches, letter openers, scissors, vases, telephones, chairs, and any heavy object. Do your best to hide from the attacker, and when he enters the room, hit him with everything you have. Don't hesitate. Be aggressive. Your life could depend on it. Welcome back. We're talking about keeping yourself safe in a very scary situation, and I'm very delighted to be joined by Commander Alan Hamilton of the LAPD. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. You know, I was talking with Mona about the Run, Hide, Fight program, but from your perspective, why is it important for people to be prepared for something like this? Well, what we like to do on the Los Angeles Police Department is make sure that people know that um, although these instances are rare, uh, you have to be prepared for them. Uh, we ask people to have a certain amount of awareness uh, before these incidents even happen so that if you do encounter an active shooter or an active assaulter, um, you've, you've kind of thought out what you're going to do. If you have family, friends, if you're in a vulnerable situation where you're in an enclosed area, uh, always have a plan and, and really run, hide, fight is part of that pre-planning so that if you go into a situation and you are unfortunate enough to encounter an active shooter or an active assault, um, you have the ability to, to think ahead, to plan ahead and to get you and your loved ones to a safe environment. So if you are in a scenario, perhaps you're in an active shooter scenario, what can you expect from the police when they arrive? So um, the first thing you should expect if there's an active shooter or an active assaulter is that we're going to uh, actively seek to encounter the suspect and neutralize the threat. So um, the most important thing for us when we get on scene is to find out who's injured and where the uh, active shooter is. So we're, we're really only concerned with those two things because the officers that are going to follow on and come behind us are going to be initiating a rescue while the other officers encounter uh, the, the suspect. So you should wait for the police to come to you. You shouldn't go to the police in that scenario because they might not necessarily know, you know, who you are in that situation. So if you're if you're in a a situation where we have someone responding right. and they encounter you, if you're running from the location, you should stop and provide whatever information, whatever solid information you have, as quickly and as. Uh, cogently as you can to the uh, to the officers because that information is key that's going to be crucial uh, going downrange trying to contact the suspects um, we also uh, want to know about any devices that may be hazardous we want to know about any additional weapons any additional suspects because um, all of those are things are threats mm -hmm. once that threat is mitigated um, we're going to need to make sure that people that are injured are taken care of and they're removed and extracted to a safe location to start immediate uh, care and then probably extract them to the nearest hospital. Can you really prepare for something that horrific? Well, you can. I mean, so some of the principles that we discuss, um, know your, you know, have an awareness of your surroundings. That is the, the most important thing, is when you're out in public, have an awareness of your surroundings. Have an awareness of where your loved ones are. Uh, where is the exit if something were to occur in here? When you go to a large, um, let's say a sporting venue or something like that, do you know how far you are from an exit? Do you know that uh, once you get outside, you can get to a parking structure that's gonna provide cover for you to flee, or even if you can't flee, for you to hide? What's the worst thing someone can do in a scenario? Um, we live in a society where social media is king, and we, we see that response of, hey, I think I'm gonna take a picture of this. It's run, hide, and fight. It is not run, hide, fight, and post this to the internet. So one of the primary things you need to do is silence your phone or turn it off. Because if, you're, if you've lost your opportunity to run and now you've transitioned to a scenario where you have to hide, that phone is gonna give your location away. Right. As far as putting things on social media, trying to get pictures and all of that other stuff, your priority is you and your loved ones right. and your safety. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate Absolutely. all of this uh, very important information, albeit I hope nobody has to use it ever, ever, ever. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. 